I usually like to begin my sermons with a little context behind the scripture because I don't believe we can truly understand scripture until we have an understanding, albeit an incomplete understanding, of where the story happened, when the story happened, why it happened, if we know that information. And we all have a context that shape who we are, a story behind how we got to where we are at this very moment. For example, I am a female of Scottish, Irish, English ancestry living in the second half of the 20th century and the first half of the 21st century in Northern America, specifically the Midwest of the United States of America. I was raised in an intact family that valued love, hard work, the arts, science, and a faith in God as expressed through a Protestant Reformed lens, and so on and so forth. And you all have your own context. Today, we don't have much time for the context of this text, except to say very quickly that Deuteronomy, obviously a book in the Old Testament, depicted the Israelites who had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, led by Moses, who are now preparing to enter the promised land that God has set aside for them, promised them. That is why we call it the promised land. But before they cross the Jordan River and enter into this land, Moses had some final words for the people that he had led, words of encouragement. And the reason he does this is because God has told him that he will not be allowed to enter the promised land. Joshua will lead them instead. So Moses needs the people to remember some things before they go without him. He reminds them of their collective journey as a people of faith thus far, and how God has been faithful to them even when they have not been been faithful to God. He urges them, stay strong in your faith because you're surrounded by a culture that worships other gods, and the temptation will be strong to fall into their ways. Basically, he tells them, behave. Kind of like that moment, you know what I'm talking about, parents and grandparents, when you are about to take your kids into a near impossible situation that is going to be hard on them, and let's be honest, hard on you as well, In terms of them being able to stay quiet and not run around shrieking at the top of their lungs, maybe that near impossible situation is coming here to church or maybe sitting through a recital or concert. Maybe it's something as simple as going to the grocery store with your kids, which sounds simple, but is actually like how I imagine Marine Corps boot camp would be if you were wearing high heels. And before you get out of the car and go into this near impossible situation, you give that little speech to your kids. You know the speech I'm talking about. Okay, now, you're going to behave. Tommy, stop pinching people. Laura, don't forget to say please and thank you and stop swearing. And Jimmy, stop eating your socks. That's kind of what Moses was doing. So during this pep talk, Moses says the words that we heard today, the words we know so well, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these are words we're familiar with, but probably not because Deuteronomy is our favorite book in the Bible, although if it is, yay for you but rather because Jesus said these same words to his followers, which we read about in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when a man asked Jesus which one of the laws is the greatest. It's important that we remember that the Mosaic law to which that man was referring was made up of hundreds and hundreds of laws that God gave to Moses, 613 laws in all. And Jesus grew up not only reading about these laws, but observing them as well. So Jesus knew how to answer the man's question because not only did Jesus know the text today from Deuteronomy, 
He also knew the text from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when the man said, teacher, which commandment is the greatest? Jesus replied using both of those scriptures, putting the two together in a new great commandment saying, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. The reason the great commandment is so important is because if Jesus' followers could obey it, love God, love neighbor, then they wouldn't break a single one of the other 613 commandments. Jesus said, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So if they could figure out how to love God completely, then they wouldn't place anything else above God. Not people, not country, not religious institutions, not nothing. And if they could figure out how to love their neighbor completely, they'd be obeying all of God's other commands concerning how to treat people. In other words, this great commandment is the foundation upon which followers of Christ, that's you and me, are able to honor and obey all the other laws God has given to his children. Obey these two and all else will fall into place. So we are unequivocally commanded to seek out and to love the people around us because God loves them and commands that we do as well. That does not mean we have to approve of their actions, their beliefs, their thoughts. We just have to love them and leave the rest up to God. God makes his home within each one of our hearts. There is a piece of the divine living within each and every one of us. Now this brings up the issue of, was there a piece of the divine in Hitler? How about Judas? Well, we'll get into that on another day. So if we want to love God, it is impossible to do this unless we love our neighbor as well. Ugh, 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 ugh. I confess that this past week, there have been moments when I have not wanted to love my neighbor. This past week, I cried a lot for reasons which will remain unnamed because I do not get into politics, but you all know the thing to which I am referring. I don't get into politics, however, I do unapologetically get into issues of justice because that's where Jesus led us, which is why I even bring this up. Now remember, this is coming out of my own context, my own history, my own beliefs, and like I said, you have your own. So you be you and I will be me. I need to respect that we're not all in the same place. But this is where I am at this particular time, at this particular place. And I confess freely and fully before I say anything else that I am a sinner of God's own redeeming, that I regularly, regularly let people down, let God down, and even let myself down. But this week, I've been disappointed to say the least, and I'm not even talking about parties. I'm not talking about political parties. Sure, I have the one I follow and I support, but to me, that was the least concerning issue on the ballot. What I'm talking about is how we are or are not modeled by those in positions of power how to love our neighbor. Now, no one is perfect. We all fall short, we all sin at times. But friends, we have to at least try to love our neighbor. And at the end of the day, when we evaluate our hearts, which we should do every day, we need to feel at least some remorse when we've hurt people or done things that do not align with God's vision for his creation. And then we have to say, God, I'm sorry. I really struggle at this. 
I miss the mark so much. Help me to be better. So I wept out of the astonishing amount of blatant hatred and disrespect and corruption that we are experiencing right now and that we have chosen to embrace and even applaud. I wept because the people I trusted to stand up and reject this hurtful way of leading are the ones who are worshiping it. There's a vision of Christianity today that is dominating America. Let us not kid ourselves, to which I cannot relate, and a vision of Christianity behind which I will never stand, and it has become the loudest voice of what it means to be a Christian in America today, and I reject it. I do not understand how we got here. I said that phrase over and over this week, and I hear it from myriad people as well. I do not understand. How is it possible that there is an acceptance of people demeaning people, using racial and sexual slurs to insult those of different races and genders and so on, mocking people who have disabilities, threatening people from other nations who have come to this country and are hardworking, contributing citizens. How is it possible that this has been embraced by people who profess to follow a savior who preached peace and justice for all, who cared for the widows, the immigrants, and the poor, and told us, if we want to follow him, you have to do likewise, who modeled to us how to serve with compassion and humility, who stood in solidarity behind those who suffered, who were hurt, who were broken, who were set apart from society and told that they did not belong. He told us that in order to love, we have to be like the Good Samaritan, who stopped to care for a man, considered an enemy by the Good Samaritan's nation, who had been beaten up and left to die in a ditch, while the religious leaders walked on by and would have let the man die. How is it we have strayed so far from Jesus' ways? So yes, this week, the thought of loving my neighbor was really, really hard because I do not understand. And yet I know that people on both sides are probably asking those questions. Maybe some of you can relate to my feelings. Maybe some of you are appalled that I am saying these things. Maybe some of you have walked out by now. That one didn't count, I don't think. There is hopelessness out there, and we have to name it. There is hopelessness in here at this very moment. I feel it, and I have heard it from your very lips. There is division out there. I pray it will never be in here within these walls, and that we can learn to love each other, even in our differences. But I confess, in all honesty, there is division within myself as well, and maybe you feel it too. I want to condemn, but I know that I am called to love. I want to judge, but I know that honor belongs to God alone. So here's the hope that I am clinging to today. We serve a God, and by we, I mean all of us here in this space and every single Christian around the world, who, whether we realize it or not, is steadfast in his command that we serve no one but him. We are to place no one and nothing else, not our leaders, not our nation, nothing on the pedestal beside him. We are to worship none but him. He demands our entire allegiance. The allegiance we pledge to our country should be an infinitesimal speck compared to the allegiance we pledge to God. That's why there are no flags in this sanctuary. And believe me, that is a huge issue, a huge divisive issue 
in churches all around our country. Because God demands this faithfulness from us and gives faithfulness to us in return, we have hope. We have the hope of knowing that God has control over this mess that we are living in right now. And God is more powerful than hate. God is more powerful than division. God is more powerful than the belief some of us have that there is no hope and that all is at an end. If we've learned nothing else from the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, we must remember there was no hope that day under the, under the cross. There was no hope when they cut Jesus' lifeless body off of that cross. There was no hope when they carried his lifeless body from that cross and placed him in the tomb. There was no hope when they walked away from that tomb and wondered if the religious leaders would come after them next, just as they went after Jesus and executed him. The unexpected, inconceivable, ridiculous joy of the empty tomb has taught us that, if nothing else, we are not in control. God is. We do not have the last word. God does. We might despair and cry and rant and rave and question why things happen the way they do, but God is saying to us today, just wait. Watch and see. I am not finished. And then God says to us, but you have to do your part. So, God says, as I work to reform and transform and heal and teach and continually call my people back into faithfulness, including you, in the meantime, do the work I have given you. Love me and love my people. Period. Figure it out, God says. Learn how to see through my eyes. See your own failings and shortcomings, and then forgive others. Have grace and give grace, period. Here's some more hope for us today. There are scriptures all over the Bible that show far from perfect, far from just leaders who time and time again inflicted great harm on their people under their power, but the common factor in these leaders was always this. We can look back on these stories and we can see God had dominion over each and every one of them. And God used their evil actions. Note that I did not say God caused their actions or that God condoned their actions. God took their very worst and turned it into good. We see that on the cross. Humanity's very worst transformed into God's very best. Now, this doesn't mean those bad leaders didn't hurt people just because God brought good out of it, because they did hurt people. Time after time, people suffered and people died, and we cannot turn a blind eye on that suffering. It's no different today. Evil causes suffering. But the events of our world are not beyond the reach of God's power, his power to heal and redeem and restore. And so I put my hope in Jesus' power to restore this hurting world one day. Until then, our marching orders are to love God and love people, to actually try to love the people around us. And sometimes we fail to even love ourselves. How are we going to love each other? When we fail to love ourselves and others fully and completely, that is the moment that we will learn to lean on God, to lean on God and ask for his mercy and strength, because it is only with the strength of God that we can truly love. And we can either feed the love that is within us, or we can feed the hate that is within us. 
And as we know from that story about the two wolves that live within each one of us, a wolf of love and a wolf of hate, the one we choose to feed is the one that will prevail. And we cannot let hate win. We do not let hate win by claiming the power that we do have today. We do have the power to lift up in this broken world an alternate vision of who God's love calls us to be, an alternate vision, one that is counter to what we are seeing around us. We can invite people, especially those with whom we disagree, to imagine a different way of seeing what it means to follow a loving God, an inclusive God, a grace-filled God, a forgiving God. And perhaps if they can come to understand that God is indeed a God of love and grace, they will begin to see that love and grace in the world around them, and eventually they will see it in their neighbors as well. And at that moment, that they see that love and grace in their neighbors, they will stop choosing to mock and kill and demean them. They will love them. So what we are invited to do today in the face of hopelessness is to share with our neighbors who have seemed to chosen hate over love this Christ-centered narrative of love and grace that we all try really, really hard to follow, albeit imperfectly, a narrative of hope and the belief that we can be better than where we are right now if we will only choose to follow Christ. Our job is not to despair, but to find the courage to lift up this alternate story, this beautiful vision of what we can be. Sometimes loving our neighbors means refusing to accept the vision they have chosen to embrace. Sometimes loving our neighbors requires us to speak up and say no to their choice. And sometimes it requires us to invite them to see a new vision for the world, one that we are trying to discern because we are imperfect in it, and one that we invite them to discern as well. They may say no to our invitation, but their no will not stop us. Part of how Jesus worked to restore this broken world was by continually tipping ideas and beliefs upside down to illustrate to those around him that his ways were not the world's ways. We too will need to have our thoughts and beliefs turned upside down at times. We will need to rewire the way we work, reimagine our own ways and habits and beliefs and behaviors until they conform with the ways of Jesus Christ. It starts with us. Only once we have rewired ourselves can we then help to reform the world around us into a community of good neighbors. And that will require courage. This world today is a test of that courage. It is a test of our endurance and our faith and our patience and our resilience and our love. But you know what? It was the same in Jesus' day. What is really important now is how we respond to what is happening in our world because our response will impact the world for generations generations to come. There's an Iroquois notion that we have to look ahead seven generations. That's about 150 years. And ask, what am I doing today that will negatively impact how they are living in their world? Following God by loving our neighbors is sacred work. And we need to keep on doing it. Every week, every day, every moment, every breath, we must keep doing this sacred, meaningful work because your work and 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 my work will all be a part of the saving grace of humankind. 
John 1, verse 5, one of my favorite verses. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The promised land, it is out there. It is out there. It might not happen fully in this world. It will maybe happen only in the world to come. But we can still see glimpses of it here and now. And our job is to stretch those glimpses, expand those glimpses by trying to love God and neighbor. So here's my prayer today as we go out beyond these walls. Almighty God, help us. Help us to have hope for this nation and for this world. Help us to have humility that we all might learn the errors of our ways and walk in your light eternal. Help us all to seek forgiveness for the sins we have committed and fill us with your strength and wisdom so we can try again. Almighty God, help us because, oh boy, do we need it. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Amen.